Well, Kevin, thank you very much for joining me. Um, if I'm correct in believing, you were in charge of the second unit action and the stunts in Halloween Ends. How did you get involved uh, in the final part of David Gordon Green's trilogy? So it's a, it's a bit of a long, I'll make it a short story. I, I met David on the movie Dukes of Hazzard uh, in Baton Rouge back in 2007, I think it was, and uh, which coincidentally is where I met my wife. Um, and uh, immediately, like, we, we hit it off. He was there. I don't think he was there with Danny, but he was with there with a few other guys. And uh, then um, uh, I created a vehicle called the Go-Mobile, which we first used on Born Supremacy. And he was fascinated by that vehicle. And then when he got Pineapple Express, he called me and I did Pineapple Express with him. And then we, we just kind of, you know, he stayed busy and I stayed busy. And then uh, on Project Power with Henry and Rel for Netflix, David's DP of choice is Michael Simmons. And uh, Michael was their DP. And at the end of the movie, we just had a great experience. And he started pitching me to David. David's like, I know Kevin. So he actually called me for Halloween Kills. And when I read the script, I'm like, oh, hell yes, I'm all in. And, and then I just, my schedule wouldn't allow it. So I actually had Aaron Armstrong cover that show for me. And who on Halloween ends, he was actually the shape double because he, he did such a great job. Um, and then when ends came up, he called me and he's like, look, we have to do this. So. So I'm going to assume that you were a huge fan of the Michael Myers, the shape character. Yeah. So what, what's interesting is I've never been a horror film guy, um, you know, and, and, and primarily because I always thought there was a lot of cheesiness and, and even before I, I'd, I'd like to consider myself a, a becoming filmmaker. Even before them, I just didn't like the blood and the gore. It didn't, it didn't bother me. I just, I never felt it was relative to the story. And um, on Halloween Kills, when I read the script and talked to David about it and listened to and understood his vision about what he wanted to tell, the story he wanted to tell. And, and he really was paying tribute to John Carpenter in the 78 films. Um, Cause I had gone back and watched all the Halloweens and it's like, I don't know, Michael died 13 times or whatever the number is, you know, and, and there's one where his head's rolling down, you know, the, the street, so to speak. And um, the, uh, w the one thing I did gain during my research was how strong and valuable the audience of Halloween is and, and how popular Jamie Lee Curtis's character, Laurie Strode was and, and how invested um, the audience is in these storylines, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and if you love Friday the 13th, you may not necessarily love Halloween, you know, it's, it's vice versa. And then um, cut to really start talking to David about the shape. And, and it just, for me, that became a huge filmmaking challenge for someone who's not a fan, which I thought was a benefit. Yeah, uh, of not being a fan because I can be objective, you know, and and uh, and but it was it, it was a lot of pressure. I felt a lot of pressure for the audience and for David and for Danny and, and for Paul Logan. who They did such a great job with the with the script. So you mentioned there that you did watch the other movies. Yeah. So Halloween ends. It takes a U-turn compared yeah. to the other ones. This one here is more of a character story. Yep. So when you were on set, were, do you remember stories of people being like, ah, oh, this is going to be such a hit? Or was people like, I don't know if fans are going to be able to sort of appreciate this compared to what they used to see in? Can you remember any of them stories? Oh, I mean, it was, it was, it was nonstop. And I think it was nonstop mainly because 95% of the crew did not have the ending of the movie. So, yeah, so it was not in the script. Um, and, and, you know, David, that was primarily what David and Danny wanted to do. And obviously the studio and Bloomhouse supported that. And when we started working on bits and pieces, we kind of had to create a little top secret environment that we could rehearse in. And, uh, uh, up until we started filming, there was a lot of, even department heads didn't really have 
the details. There was a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings that were taking place. You know, what do we do here? Do you need this knife? Do you need that knife? And the great thing for me was, is, you know, the prop master and, and the set deck and the production designer, like they all have the history because they did all three. Um, so I didn't, I had experts to rely on as, as far as, as what components there were. Um, but the, most of the crew really didn't know what we were doing in the ending until we started filming it. So there wasn't a lot of conversation about that, but there was certainly a lot of conversation about what are they going to do? What were your takes on the final product? Because I'm sure as you, reviews have set out there there's mixed yeah. reviews i honestly thought it was great i was invested in the characters and i loved it i thought it was a good bookend to the to well the saga of michael and laurie yeah i i think it's i think it's impossible to ever make the entire audience happy i agree i i think it's it's probable that you're going to piss off half the people and the other half are going to be somewhere between happy and glad and sad. Um, and, and I personally was so impressed with David's vision of what he, the story he wanted to tell. He never wavered from the core of the story. Like he knew what the story wanted to be. He knew how shape and Lori had to end their journey. Yeah. Um, coming up with the process to make that happen took, you know, our creative team to do that. But, and I think the audience, it's really tough for the audience to really understand the big picture of how do you wrap up 44 years uh, of, of story in, you know, an hour and 50 minutes, you know, and, and there's no way that you can make everybody happy. The one thing I will say is the, the day I met Jamie Lee, it was on a Sunday and she came in before the day before we started shooting or before she started shooting. And we walked through the fight with her and she was ecstatic. Like she was blown away. And, and that made me feel good because that's 44 years of the person who played Lori Strode. Yeah. And to make her happy uh, and to make her excited and to make her, her creative juices fly was it, it had to happen for the ending to, to go the way it did. And James was the same way. I mean, Jay, the entire cast was amazing, but in particular, Jamie and, 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 uh, and James together are, are pretty epic. And, and James loved every, every bit of everything. Well, can you remember the feeling of when James first put on the mask and the costume and came on set. Can you describe, um, did the set go silent? Was it, did it get airy? Um, I, you know, I, I, for, for a lot of the crew, because they've seen it for the last, you know, several years, um, for me, it was a pretty epic moment. You, you know, I mean, that, that was like the Holy grail. Like you couldn't touch the mask. You couldn't, you know, and, and, and Chris Nelson, who, who designed the mask, who built all the prosthetics. He and his team did an unbelievable job, uh, particularly how they make, turn him into what shape looks like underneath the mask. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is unbelievable. And uh, for me in particular, it was kind of like game time. You know, it, it, I really understood how the audience feels about that mask at that moment. Um, and, and I think James is the shape. I agree. And, and, and I think when he puts on that mask, he takes over that persona in an amazing performance, in an amazing way. Um, and, and most importantly, he values the opportunity to have, have been the shape. And that was sort of going to go on to that as well. I've heard that as soon as James gets in costume, he becomes the shape and it, he could be the nicest guy ever when you're just talking to him during breaks, but when he puts on that mask, he is the shape. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, he, he doesn't leave it on in, in between takes for a lot, for a lot of period of time. Um, you know, you spend enough time in the industry on set and, and you understand to give actors their space in between takes. Um, me personally, I just, I, I give 
unless I need to give input or ask if you're, you're okay, you need water or whatever, which we had to do that a lot in the fight. Um, I kind of just stay away and let them do their thing. Um, James is, he's a very philosophical, deep thinking individual and gives a lot of thought to everything he does and a lot of care to everything he does. So, th so there's a level of respect that, that you immediately have for him and you really give him the space to be the shape. And then the same sort of question for Laurie, what was it like being able to work with Jamie Lee on like her final installment as Laurie Strode? Like this is the final girl we've seen since 78. That must've been quite astounding. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's honestly the, the reason that I, I did. I, I wanted to help David do the film anyway, but to be part of the, the, the filmmaking process that determines the end of a 44 year franchise, that's a big deal. Uh, it was a very big deal to me. Um, Jamie knows exactly what she wants. And, and she's also, she's a very caring individual. I've never, it's rare that you meet an actor or an actress that spends a lot of time really concerned about the crew. And, you know, are they getting enough sleep and, you know, let's get them some food and this game. So like, she's very concerned about everybody in the middle of some very heated scenes. Um, and, and, and by any means, she's not a method actor. You know, I mean, she's very reactive to the moment uh, and she's extremely talented. And, and I remember having a conversation with her and I said to her, I said, Jamie, I'm just absolutely amazed at the person you are because to me, you're Hollywood royalty. I agree. And, and her response was, I'm just a kid that grew up in the backyard and had fun. <laughs> um, and, and, and she, and, but when she becomes Lori, like when she became Lori in that fight, that was a huge turn. I mean, that, that was, you know, I don't, I have not seen many people go from a calm individual to absolute rage, you know, at, at the drop of a hat. She's very, she's a very good actress, very versatile. She like from, she's done action movies, comedies, thrillers, yeah. horrors, she's, she's unbelievable, isn't she? 63 years old. Um, the only things that she didn't do in the fight were, you know, the throw off the table, and uh, I mean, that actually may have been it. She, want, she insisted on doing the head slam into the cabinet, like argued with me, <laughs> um, like told me, this is the way it's gonna be, you know, be happy with it. Uh, you're not gonna um, argue with Jamie Lee? Nah, you know, it's tough. Uh, <laughs> you know, and for me, uh, it, it's a fine line, you know, for uh, an action second director and stunt coordinator relationship with an actor, it's a 50-50 relationship. You know, they have to, know that I'm not going to do something that's going to get them hurt. And I have to know that they're not going to do something stupid to get themselves hurt. And, and early on, I had that conversation with everyone, uh, you know, on the film and, and she just looked at me and she goes, sweetheart, you just hold on. <laughs> and, and I did. And, and she, like, she, she gave every take 150%. There was not, even when she's tired, she doesn't drop her performance. You mentioned, obviously a moment ago about the stunts there in the movie and the action there are quite a few segments that are action you know like you've got the well, spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it you've got the junkyard scene you know with the truck going through the gate then you've got Corey in the sewers yeah what was the most challenging stunt to put together it's a great question um I don't know if there was one specific sequence. And the only reason I say that is as a filmmaker, I don't, I don't really get excited about the huge Marvel movies and the massive CGI sequences. You know, I, I really want the action to be part of the story and be seamless with the story. Yeah. And, and this film in particular required the action to not stick out. You know, the action had to make sense to the story, had to make sense to the 44 year journey. Um, the, the junkyard sequence uh, was something that we definitely had to work on. And I, I couldn't be happier with how it came out, you know, in the ending. Um, the lead up to the, to the, um, the procession 
the lead up to the junkyard. Uh, that was a bit of nerve wracking because basically we had like one night or two nights and, you know, we had 50 cars and, you know, four stuntmen and a city that we were hoping didn't show up with all their cameras and iPhones, um, <laughs> you know, and, and take the pictures and, um, the, and then obviously the fight, the fight was a challenge, but I had an extremely strong team, Corey DeMeyers, uh, my, one of the stunt coordinators I had on the film and my fight coordinator, and I, he's been with me since mile 22. Um, we, we had plenty of time to rehearse and build that fight with David, shoot the previs, the stunt viz, and, and everybody knew when we got close to filming, like the day before I released the previs and said, okay, this is what we're doing. And then everybody was like, holy shit. Okay. That's, that's cool. Uh, and then, uh, David shot, you know, probably the lion's share of, of the, of the fight. And then I did a lot of cleanup, uh, which is, which is pretty normal, um, for a person like myself. And, uh, and, and I really like all the work we did in the cave in, in, uh, in shapes cave. Uh, you know, that was, that was challenging. And what's challenging different than the other films are is you're using almost like a film to water approach. You're using light in ways you didn't You're using shadows in ways you didn't used to, you're using reveals and camera movements for the audience to create and feel that suspense, which is a lot different than just shooting a normal action sequence. You, you know, with the next sequence, you set up your angles, you got three cameras, you, you know, the, the, the one will be complimentary, the other one will be cross and, and the other one is dead on. And in the edit room, you make it work. Well, that doesn't happen on, on a horror film like Halloween. In Halloween, you're playing the suspenseful moment. You're playing the dramatic effect, you're playing not wanting to reveal an entire face or see part of a hand or what, whatever. So it's a lot more challenging as a filmmaker to participate in that, in that sequence. Um, while we're, we're, you mentioned the case sequence there, I remember seeing footage of Corey falling down, like tumbling mm -hmm. down sort of a bit. Yeah. Was that in the cave, was it? Was that like a deleted scene? Um, yeah, so... <laughs> We shot a lot in the cave. The cave was so cool that it was really hard to get out of it, <laughs> right? And, and, and David really fought to keep uh, as much in as possible. And he, I think it came down to the length of the film. I, I know David really likes an hour and 30 minute film. And there was just no way to get this story down to that. Um, the, 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 the Corey sequence was about three times longer than what, what you actually see. It, you know, it, it's, a, it's a story of him escaping, him falling down, gets the shit scared out of him because that's where a lot of the bodies, the bones are from previous kills of, of the shape. And he crawls back up and he goes out. And, and obviously David didn't have time to tell that in, in entire story on the edit. Um, and and I, I will say that from Corey's perspective, uh, and there's nothing like having a formal, uh, a former parkour world champion um, a, as a stunt double. Uh, I mean, he took some really serious hard hits. You know, he's basically just holding yourself on on a ladder, and and you know, we we call it frappe or taco yourself. You know, and bouncing off the set pieces and landing, you know, on the floor. Um, I mean, he did an amazing job. And, you know, you can't keep everything. In I, me personally, I'm very happy with how the film came out. I'm extremely happy with the choices that David made. I support all the choices that David made. I, I think I think it's the right amount of action uh, for the story. In this particular standpoint, the story is so much more important than the action, but the action always helps lift the story. I agree. My only gripe with the film was um, I thought it could have been longer. I, so I'm fingers crossed that we get like an extended cut when it hits Blu-ray. You know, I mean, you never know. I, I think that um, it's always a possibility. There's so much story and so much footage that is not in that hour and 50 minutes. It, you know, the, you certainly could justify uh, a, a director's cut, you know, or something uh, with, with a little more meat to it. Um, but it's, it's I, I think... The length of the film as it is, I think the flow is great. It moves along. I think any longer and you'd start to question what's going on. Yeah, true. Because the pacing is so important 
with drama and, and, and with, with horror films and, and suspenseful films, you know, and, and it's something I really, you know, come to learn in detail on Halloween ends. And the idea that, that a lot of times uh, a second director or an action director or stunt coordinator, if half the a fight or something gets cut, they, they go crazy. You know, for me, I was more concerned about all of the story being told in the fight than I was the fight being in total. And you really don't know how everything comes together until you start cutting it. And obviously you've got scenes that you're coming in and out of, which dramatically affect how the fight flows. And I, I think that's the case with a lot of the action pieces, uh, unlike Kills, which Kills was pretty much action from after minute 10 to, you know, till it ended. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and this was definitely more of a, it's not, not that Halloween Kills wasn't a story-based film, but Halloween Ends is, is we're ending a 44-year franchise. Um, you touched upon fight sequences there. There was the fight sequence in the cave between Corey and Michael. Mm -hmm. Was that ever filmed to be maybe like longer or did you ever try and decide what way you were going to film it? Because it's filmed from just the tunnel's point of view. Did yeah. you ever play around with the idea of getting up close and personal with them or was it always intended just to be the quick, rough tussle we see? No, we, we shot all of that. We, we, we shot it. We shot it wide. We shot it close. We shot details. Um, and, and then, you know, I think from a storytelling standpoint, I think David was really drawn to sealing it happen through the tunnel. And while you lose a lot of detail in the fight, you know, it's one of those choices and he's the director. So he gets to make that choice. I support the choice of not going into and seeing more of the fight. I, I certainly wanted to. But I understand that at that point, he sort of wanted the audience to be voyeur, be, have it be a voyeuristic experience versus be right there. Um, and, and because you still, there's still a moment in the characters, those two characters at, at that moment of, of who, who is, without giving anything away, we know that Corey takes on a persona. Yeah. And, and, I think you could have made some mistakes by literally doing the typical fight scene inserts, but we did shoot all of all those angles and, and, and it all looked great. But again, I, I support David's choices for uh, through the tunnel. And then the final battle, the battle everyone's waiting for, how long did it take to put that together, especially for like you? Cause that's your bread and butter right there. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's your go-to. How long did it take for you to, piece all that together and set up start so, you know so david wrote the 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 basis of the fight you know he actually in, in prep uh we we talked a couple of times and he was actually in his kitchen you know playing around on a table just just you know spitballing ideas um and once we got the physical space we spent probably three to four weeks in total um from working out the moves to okay this is the fight that david likes and then that's when we brought in david and jim uh or sorry jamie and jim um courtney to to learn the fight and then it was a couple of weeks after that until we actually shot it um and like i said we did have pre-vis or stunt vis as we, as we call it so so jamie and and, and james actually had a, a good reference to 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 use and and we also worked with them you know from time to time when they had 15 20 minutes and we would just worked through the moves the uh it, it's so performance based um as much on james as it was on jamie's part right that that the moves weren't as critical as they normally would be but the emotion and the effect and why is she doing this and the choices she's making and well why didn't she do this and why didn't she do that like that's to me that was the real unique aspect about this fight um, is it's all story and there happens to be some knives and some blood and some really cool stuff but it's really all story and then and then a lot of conversations and a lot of time was spent on the final moments of of the fight and and what's behind it um, and and that was a I'm I'm truly honored to have been part of that sequence um because it was a situation where there was a room full of 
very creative, talented people that basically all were on the same page, you know, and, and, uh, and most importantly, David, Jamie and James were happy. And the killer question, was Michael always intended to die? That is a killer question. <laughs> um, let's put it this way. As, as a new fan of Halloween, my answer is, I think Michael, the body had to go away, but I'd like to believe that Michael, the persona could live on. Yeah. And, and, and staying with David's approach in the 78 Carpenter film and not, not addressing the, is she Michael's sister, you know, are they you know, related, so on and so forth. Um, there, there's a bit of a, of a fine line uh, in the dark side of the world where, um, you, you know, a sealer, serial killer or a killer becomes, hi Bubba's, hi Bubba's, a serial <laughs> killer becomes the person or the person chasing the killer becomes that person, yeah. right? And I, and I think, um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of room open for interpretation for the audience of what could happen um th there's a there's a really interesting twist with the mask as you know since you've seen the film um that that i was very fortunate to have a, a a good hand uh to make a suggestion on what do we do at this point and um i'm not aware of any talks or discussions to continue the story but i will say that in my mind there's a story where the persona of Michael Myers could live on. Yeah, I got the feeling like Corey got a sample of that. And then if anyone's read the novel, um, yeah. spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Laurie sort of yeah. becomes the shape to a degree. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, it's, I mean, I'd like to touch on, on Rohan for a second. What an amazing actor he is. I mean, the okay. range and the performance he goes from the beginning of the film where he's this nice kid that's babysitting to who he becomes uh, is an amazing arc. And he was such a pleasure to work with. He's such a great guy. Um, and Andy too. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a great, um, it's a great group of actors, uh, but but Rohan really showed an amazing range in that. Um, and th th there's a couple of tricks. I'll give away a little secret. A lot of people may not know, but uh, we use dark contact lenses. So on Rohan, so there are moments when he's wearing dark contact, so he'd be the bad guy. He'd be Michael Myers, right? And it's a very subtle, filmmaking change that you use and people don't really notice it as much they just it, it's a feeling or it's like a holy shit he looks scary now um and, and it's a very subtle having dark contacts on it's a very subtle change but i think it also really helped rohan get into character was it um always the idea to go down this route with the third installment because rumors were circulating that it was to pick up on the same night as Halloween kills. Did you hear anything about that? I, I think after kills, there was a lot of conversations of, of how do you end it? I and mean, that's really what it comes down to is, is, is everyone had agreed that, that the franchise ends, so to speak, as we know it, the franchise ends. Um, and, and obviously that's above my pay grade. Uh, and, and I'm sure that that Danny and, and David and Paul um, and and the Bloomhouse team had a lot of conversations for a year plus, you know, figuring out what to do. And I think that once they started putting it on paper and once they had a a shooting draft of the script, we, we pretty much were there. The the ending did change. We did do some reshoots. So the ending was did change. I, I think the ending that we shot, the, the new ending that they came up with is, is an amazing ending. Um, and for me, 
you you really had to pay tribute to the town of Haddonfield. Yeah. And and you really wanted the townspeople to be part of the process. And and they were. And and I think that's that's really cool. And, and, so, and it's like I said, it's amazing that we pulled it off in in a matter of hours, not days, you know, to get that sequence. Um Overall, how long did you just have to film the movie? Does a movie like this get a few months? I think we had 35 days or 38 days. Well, yeah, it's not a lot. <laughs> Jeez, uh, I thought it would have been a good couple of months to get something like that. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, you know, horror films don't get the budgets that bigger budgets do, you know. Um, you know, on a $100 million for, on a film, we'd have 75, 80 days on first unit and I could have 35, 40 days of second unit. Um, you, you don't have the, the luxury of that on a film like this. And I actually don't think, I think that would maybe spoil it. I think the, I think the way, the way that David runs his set, um, he's very open to input and creativity and he does an amazing job of not losing center, the focus of, of his vision. And a lot of directors can't do that. So they don't want input. And, and, you know, I did see moments where every once in a while a crew member or a producer or somebody would say something, he'd be like, well, wait a minute, okay, that's cool, let's try that. It, you know, and, and, and usually it's for the better. Um, but um, I, I, I really don't know after kills of how much conversation and how much development they had to go through until they came up with the story that they have. And then once filming had wrapped after the shoot, what was the atmosphere like on the last day of set? Was it emotional or? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously Jamie was very emotional. Jamie was very emotional the day uh, of. So Jamie had, had, had been over at another set and she wrapped, main unit wrapped her. And then she came to me and that's, we, we did some of the, the pickup shots for the fight um and so i actually wound up having the honor and the pleasure to direct to have jamie the, the actual last scene the last performance in in principal photography i directed that versus versus our main unit obviously everything i do i do i did for david um yeah. and, and that and that's that was great having um being so aware of his vision and and he was so true to it and also so open to conversation and I could call him anytime and say, Hey, here, I'm, I'm in this sequence. This is what I'm feeling. What do you think? He'd be like, go for it. Um, and, and I think it was, a, I think it was emotional for the crew. I mean, most of that crew had been with David the entire run. Um, certainly for Andy and for James and for Jamie, it was emotional, but also Chris Nielsen, who was so critical with the special effects makeup um Richard Wright our, our production designer I mean every, everybody had been with it from the beginning Michael Simmons obviously the DP and and to a certain extent I mean we were so happy it was going to be over because it's such a grueling shoot and I hate working nights um but you're also very sad that that moment arrived fans always love to see Michael dispatch people in very very brutal ways what would you say is your favorite kill and ends I, I, li I like the nurse sequence at Dr. Matthews house and, and that, that was a little different type of kill. Um, I, I think it was a little, it was a little more intimate that Michael had been with, with his, with his victims, so to, so to speak. Um, she did an unbelievable job in portraying someone who's getting, who's dying. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and I, I really, but also at that same time with Rohan stabbing Dr. Matthews, you know, in that mask and looks up, I mean, that, that whole sequence is just, it, it was a different type of, there were different type of kills than what we've normally seen Michael participate in. Yeah, it was very brutal, wasn't it? Very brutal. Um, and, and it, it's, you know, what's interesting is uh, I think from an actor's perspective, it's really hard not to be affected at times when you're involved in a scene like that, 
you know, and, and, um, and Chris Nielsen made a, a, a life-size dummy uh, of Dr. Matthews. So Rohan is actually stabbing a, a dummy and it looked like Dr. Matthews. It did. Uh, yeah. And so, so that's, that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, and, and with, with our nurse, it was, it was real her. I mean, it was, everything was her and just some, a few camera tricks um, that we use to, to sell the, the, the moves, so to speak. Um, but it's also the one thing I did really pay attention to and learn is how the shape acts when he kills. And, and in rehearsals, you just kind of let James do his thing. And, and in that way, he communicates to you what, what he's going to do and what's going to happen. Um, because it, Michael is, is, in my mind, a different person when he's killing versus not. And, and for example, in the cave, you know, he's, he's been beat up, he's, he's, he's tired, he's exhausted, and he starts to get his energy back um, because he feels a kill coming on. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the, the regeneration of Michael and, and the, and the life of Michael was, was pretty dependent on killing people. So during, um, the shoot, did James play Michael in all of the kill scenes or was it just where Michael was needed? Cause the movements of the shape, like, when Corey is going towards the DJ booth, that looks mm-hmm. like James's movements from the 2018. So was mm-hmm. it James mm-hmm. in all the shots or was it actually Rohan dressed as the shape? The uh, James insists on, and I supported him doing everything as Michael for the shape. Then when it came to Rohan being the shape, then then Rohan did did wear the mask, um, and the same for Corey. Corey did did as well. Um, uh, Corey Demeyer who doubled him as well. Um, the and it is interesting, in particular with Rohan and Corey Demeyer's. There was a lot of conversations, and I did work with James extensively on how he walks, how he thinks, how he moves. Because you really don't want the audience to know or to give away that, and even though there's a pretty decent size difference, that what happens, happens. Yeah. Would you say that James would be the perfect Michael Myers? It's a difficult question because I did not work with the other people who played Michael Myers. I do know that Nick Castle came on board and he was with us um, for, for a couple of days of filming. And I know that Nick is very supportive of James and the work he's done in, in the last three. And I, mean, I think to me, that's a testament to, to how James takes on the shape. Um, I think that watching an actor perform the way I did with James I think it would be hard to find someone to do a better job. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I, I think the, the need to be intense and pay attention in particular to little tiny movements, uh, which is, is how detailed James was with the shape. And it's also a character that, that David and James created together, right? Um, you know, I think that's probably harder than speaking, to be honest with you. I think I think it's easier to have dialogue where you can get lost in, 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 in so to speak, in times where, when you're really not saying anything, it's your performance is what you see. Yeah, and the like when you were just filming, just in general, was there more stuff of Michael shot? Because that's one of the complaints as well. You always see online there wasn't enough. Michael, was there more Michael for its shot that just didn't make it into the final cut? I mean, I'm sure there is. You know, I, I think, you know, what's interesting about the, 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 and I spent so much time in edit rooms, what's interesting about the time from the script 
to principal photography, to reshoots if you need to do it, to pickups, and then through the edit process is, it's not until the edit process that the story really comes together. And, yeah. and up until that, you're basically shooting vignettes. You shoot a lot of vignettes. A scene is a vignette. A scene could last one minute, two minutes, five minutes, whatever it may be. And, and on paper, it doesn't play as it does visually. And, and when you put everything together, which I have so much respect for the editorial professionals that we have in our industry, when you start taking all these vignettes and putting them together, the story will find itself if you allow it to. And, and I think that's what happened here. And I, I think people always want to see more Michael, right? I mean, it's, it's like the, the mask behind, you know, your, your, your face. I mean, that's, that's what people want to see. And I don't think you'd ever see enough of it. You know, I think you saw more of it in Kills. Kills was a different story, a different movie than Ends is. Um, I think the choices that David made, to me, supports the emotion of the journey that needed to be told to end the franchise. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I think there are going to be audience members that are never going to be happy that they didn't see more Michael you know, or more Lori, like the people were upset. I read a lot of comments uh, after kills. Of, where was Lori? She was in a hospital, right? Like that, not everybody liked that, you know? And, and I think, um, I think it's armchair quarterbacks, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, and, and that's, that's what I touched on when we first started talking is, is that I think the horror film audience and particularly the Halloween audience is so invested in this story and when you think about it, like, I'm not aware of another franchise that's lasted 44 years. Me neither. Um, you know, and, and, and it's ups and downs and peaks and valleys. And, and, and you, know, the, the, you know, the other movies, a lot of them took unbelievable directions. You know, and, and I don't know if you've seen John Carpenter's book from the 1978 Halloween uh, movie. No, uh, but he has, a, he has a coffee table book back, which is absolutely fascinating. And for me, um, you know, I went through that and saw just seeing the images of, of him and, and Laurie uh, on Jamie is Laurie on set and the different aspects of of Nick and what happened like that was that was a, a pretty amazing. It helped me a lot in the journey to help end this this franchise and, and it also allowed me to see visually without the fodder of dialogue and talk of of what john carpenter wanted to see which is what david truly supported is is he supported the wise and the hows of of john carpenter's vision and speaking of the man the myth the legend that is john carpenter did you get to meet him i didn't it was very i'm very bummed that i didn't get to meet him um his score is, is amazing the music is amazing uh, you know for the film I really would have would have enjoyed meeting meeting uh, Mr. Carpenter, um, and, uh, and and mainly just to say thank you. I mean, it's it's again like I, you know, I'm going to do some research after we finish because I don't know of another franchise that's lasted 44 years. I don't think the, I don't think Star Wars has lasted 44 years. Because <laughs> I think Star Star Wars came out after Halloween, right? I'm not too sure. I've never really yeah. followed. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, when you think about it, like 44 years of films that basically follow one set of characters, that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that is. It's not often you get that. And I'm trying to think, I'm racking my head now trying to think of another franchise, but I just can't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think there is. I mean, obviously there's, you know, Friday the 13th version 240. Um, there's a lot of those, but I don't, I don't think it's lasted as long. Um, it, it's, it's definitely a challenge. And I think what's also very interesting is, 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 you know, I talked to David a lot about, about John Carpenter's input and his thoughts and his feelings and, and for him to be still invested and so clear and, and, and so supportive of the movie he started so long ago, you know, and it's just not the money. You know, it's the fact that he truly cares about this story. And, and I think that's why he supported, you know, David doing 2018 is because, uh, because David, you know, really took to heart 
what the story that John Carpenter told. And if I'm correct for yourself, this was like your first sort of slasher movie, wasn't it? Your first horror movie? Yeah. Yeah. You returned to the genre? It's a good question. <laughs> for me, now that I've been through the process, for me, I'd want a David Gordon Green as a, as a director. You know, I, I, I'd want, um, cause there are moments of, uh, let's just do it for more blood, but, but all the moments that David tells in this story is for the story's sake. And, and I think, and that's kind of my issue with a lot of the horror films is I'm just not that person that wants to see the slasher. Movie. Yeah. You know, I want to see the story, you know, I, I want to, I want, I want the story to reach out and grab me and slam me against the wall and make me pay attention and somebody getting stabbed multiple times or shot or whatever it's going to be that doesn't necessarily get my attention but the story does so i, I think i think another horror film that's story driven um that won't be 40 a 44 year franchise absolutely i you know i would and, and especially because now that my feet are wet uh so to speak with with the genre now i know what to expect and in terms of horror to action, it, would it be sort of easier stunt-wise, action sequence-wise? Um, for me, no, because I've spent my entire career really focusing on seamless action between the story and, and, and the stunts, so to speak, right? And, um, I don't like doing action just for the sake of action, you know, and, and, and I don't like car crashes because the movie's boring. Let's throw in a car crash. Like that's yeah. just not, those aren't the movies that I, that I like to make. I, I, I always personally try to find the heartbeat of the story and then follow that heartbeat. And to me, I'm able to find action that truly resonates for the audience. And, um, I think more action for Halloween ends will probably wouldn't tell the right story. Yeah, agreed. The action was served its purpose in kills. Yes. And ends is just the time for, well, what this That's title right. says, ends. Yeah. I mean, even David refers kills as a bloodbath, right? And, and, and that's awesome. Like, I, I really wish I could have done kills. I just was, I couldn't, my schedule wouldn't work out. Um, and there was three times the action in kills, there was ends. Um, but to me, there's five times the story in ends than there was kills. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, that's, that's what motivates me as a filmmaker to, to participate in and be part of is, is, is the story. And it comes full circle as it brings back characters from the franchise. Like it brought back, um, Sandra, who had been through the trauma of watching her husband die and losing the ability to talk. It's everything that you've seen from 2018 gets wrapped and mm -hmm. that's it. It mm -hmm. doesn't leave room for a sequel. No, and, 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 and I think that's, I think David did a masterful job in finalizing the story of Michael Myers as we know it, you know, because yeah. you, 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 I don't think you can leave an open door for Michael with Halloween ends. I think Michael's door has to close. And, and in my opinion, it did. It closed pretty well. Um, it's going to be hard to believe that he comes back after that. But like we talked about earlier, whether or not the persona continues, that's a whole other discussion and way above my pay grade. Um, and who knows, five years down the road, maybe Bloomhouse will pick it up. Maybe David will say, let's do something else. I, I'm not aware of any discussions whatsoever. I will, full disclosure, I will say that. But I, and I, and I've not heard any discussions. Um, but I think it's up to the audience, right? I think if the audience is screaming for that story to continue, then Hollywood will probably say, yeah. And Jamie, David, and James have all said they are done with Halloween. Would you say the same if another company came along that David wasn't 
attached to and it was someone else, would you come on board if asked or? I won't say yes, but I won't say no. <laughs> and again, and I think it, it's because I really want to see the story. You know, I, I think it, it's, it's so vitally important to me and my team and to have been part of, of telling the end of this 44 year franchise that if it does pick back up, I'd really want to know what that story is and how it's going to be told before I commit to it. Um, Cause it's just, it's, you know, jobs like this shows like this aren't just aren't paychecks. You yeah. know, these are, uh, I felt more pressure on this film than I did on project power, which was, you know, 10 times more action. Um, you know, because you don't have, you don't have an audience for project power that you did for, uh, for Halloween ends. Yeah, I agree. Um, it'd be very hard to redo another Halloween movie quite so soon. Don't you agree? A hundred percent. I mean, I think, I think it's gotta be put to bed, you know, let, let the dog, let the dogs lie where they are. I think a, a great, a bit of time has to go by. Um, and, and then I think also, you know, films are a cyclical nature, you know, you know, all of a sudden now Westerns are coming back and we didn't see Westerns for 10 years, you know, so, um, you know, I think the horror films, they always have a tendency to, to, to be in the background, but, yeah. but certainly some of the franchises have, have continued to exist in a much larger way than horror films have in the past. I think that if the Michael Myers persona is to continue, I think you'd want to see some time in between this film and, and the next. And, and to be honest with you, I don't know who writes that because I don't think David would come back. Um, and, and I don't know about Paul Logan, who, who his input was invaluable. Um, you know, I mean, my nickname for Paul is kind of Superman. He's this, this little meek mannered guy that has the mighty power of the keystrokes. And, uh, and I don't know if, if, if Paul would come back, you know, I mean, I just, uh, I, I'm sure Bloomhouse would, because that's, that's what Bloomhouse does or Blumhouse, Bloomhouse. Um, <laughs> I never know how to say that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think they probably would, but again, I think you need some time to go away before you think about telling that again. I agree. Um, anyone involved with the production, I think, I think they would step away just as you said, Paul Logan, he wrote the book and, you know, he wrote the screenplay and then he wrote the novel and the novel differs to the movie a great deal. I don't know if you've read the novel or, but like the way the novel ends is it sets up for Carpenter's original vision, original vision of Halloween, which was um, a different story about a different evil every year so from the way the book ends you could pick up with any character who just inherits this evil yeah and, and i and i think that that's the interesting part about books and movies you know and in this case the movie kind of came before the book um is is that um paul having wrote, written the screenplay he had the foresight that others didn't and and he certainly can project the possibilities which he does um, and, and whether or not the book becomes the source, if the story does continue, he certainly does open the path for that to happen. Um, it, you know, I, I think the, the, it was interesting on Lone Survivor, because I was part of that movie from the very beginning when Pete Berg got the book till, till we finished the movie. And, and Pete actually went to Syria on the border of, of Iraq um, and embedded with SEAL Team 5 for 30 days as a journalist. And when he came back, he said, I know what the movie's about. And I said, yeah, the movie's about the Brotherhood. And he goes, exactly. Now, when you, when you read that book, there's 20 movies in that book. And what movie do you tell? The, the, the screenplay that Pete wrote is based on the nuggets of the book, but there's nothing verbatim from the book. And I think the same would play with Paul Logan's book and Paul Logan's novel is, is that yeah. I think, I think it suggests the possibilities of what could be done, but
But again, whoever decides to take that story on, if it does happen, both the writer and the director, they're going to have their own opinions of what the story they want to tell. And obviously, they're not going to want to do what David, uh, what, what David and Danny and Paul did. Um, they, they want to tell a different story. And hopefully we do get more Michael in the future. But for now, we will just enjoy David's trilogy. A hundred percent. I would, I would be a fan of, of, I will say this now that I'm a fan of the Halloween franchise, I would be a fan of, of another movie with the Michael Myers persona that you may not know who it is at the end of the movie. That'd be unreal, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like that would be, um, I mean, if you, in my opinion, if you want to restart the franchise, that's how you do it. And, um, and, and, and maybe it isn't one of the characters that we now know and, and love, you know, maybe it's Hawkins, you know, maybe <laughs> Hawkins has had enough and he becomes Michael. I mean, it, it, it's hard to tell, but, but certainly the possibilities are endless. And, and I think it ultimately it comes up to the viewing audience and, 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 you know, what people want to see. I, I hope that, I hope that the audience continues to embrace the film. You know, I think it's, it's uh, everyone talks about the box office. Well, it's hard to have a box office representation when it goes streaming the same day it goes on box office. I think the fact that we opened with $46 million or whatever it was, um, and at the same day, people could stay home and watch the movie. I think that's pretty epic. Yeah. I, I, think, it, I think it's going to stay strong. The sad thing is we really don't know, or we're not told, um, the streaming aspect of how popular it is. Um, just people that I've talked to that don't ever watch horror films and have watched it because I was part of it. And, and I'm thankful for that. Everybody has commented on the fact that there's a story there. It's just not a slasher movie, you know? So who knows, maybe David's Halloween end will bring in a whole new set of audience members that didn't exist for the horror films. Well, that's so. I hope so. We can always do a new fans to the franchise, can't we? Absolutely. You can never have enough fans. Well, Kevin, it has been awesome having you feature. Congratulations on the success of Halloween Ends. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your questions. And uh, I guess we'll see you at the movies. See you soon, David. David, Kevin. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Thanks Thank again, man. Appreciate it. Mate. All right. Bye.